Don't get your panties in a bunch. You'll see me again soon enough. I figured that ridden the city of the Mad Gear would make everybody happy. Not just me. All of us. But this is my reward, huh? Everyone else goes on to live the high life, and I get left behind in a prison cell. A city where no one has to fight. A city free from violence. A city without fear. <laughs> yeah, give me a break. I thought I was fighting for peace in this city. Look where it got me. The drag, man. Would you look at that? <laughs> well, I'll be damned. Looks like we're in for a reunion. Maybe this won't be so boring after all. I actually wanted to talk about Barbie even more because she's so awesome. But since I have a curse to discuss a garbage TV show filled with garbage characters and garbage writing, I might as well do it because this curse is my only friend. How's it going everyone? My name is Cyrus the Stewart Basher and today we are going to once again talk about my favorite cartoon of all time. DISASTROUS FECAL MATTER! After watching Sam Hill, I took a very long break by watching actual good TV shows like Barbie Dream House Adventures, South Park, The Simpsons, King of the Hill, and Bucky. Now that that's done, I feel like that guy who was about to win a trial. Uh, yeah. Okay, let's get to it. That's what she said. Season 1, in my opinion, is incredible because this is where the show doesn't take itself seriously. And for me, that is MLB at its very best. A garbage TV show that takes advantage of the fact that it's garbage. That's the biggest reason why I think TTG is a comedic masterpiece. It's trash and it knows it. It makes it so much fun to watch. Just like Disastrous Ladybug Season 1. Season 2 is where the kicks are starting to pump up. The truest reason why this crap is amazing is the fact that the story and the characters are beginning to get more complex and interesting. We are now getting more information about why the things we have seen in season 1 happen all the time. Season 2 is not perfect since the execution is not that great and not every episode is good. I'm looking at you. But it is overall decent. I love how this show wasn't taking itself seriously back in season 1, but I love it even more when it begins to get more elaborate with its narrative and dramatist persona. Season 3, the season where things get really low. There is not a single good episode present here. The best episode in this season, in my opinion, is on Nietzsche. I don't even think it's good, mostly because of... <sighs> 6 out of 10, okay. But comparing this to every single chapter of the third season, including the stupid ass finale, this is honestly number one because it is the most simple, the most tolerable, the most enjoyable, and the least frustrating. But keep in mind, it's not even a good episode. It's just average. The best episode of season three is just average. Season three is that bad. Season 4. So far, it's been a disaster. I just rewatched the first 5 episodes that I have seen, and looking back, I think I want to take back what I said about Gang of Secrets. 7 out of 10, Mary is a great crybaby. The reason why I hated it so much at first is because of recency bias. I wasn't being fair, and I'm truly sorry. That's why I wanted to take it back. I promise, no, I'll try to not let recency bias take over me again. I'm not taking back what I said about truth, lies, and this piece of shit. They are so bad, especially truth. Duh, who is my father? I need to know. I thought this episode is about uncovering the truth about Marinette. But for some reason, during this scene, the episode did a 180. Tell me why. Tell me why. Because they were so desperate into making the audience care about this guy. Give me a break. I can't even recall his name. Um... Gary? Stu? I don't know, and I don't care. Or maybe I should care, since he now knows who these guys are. That makes him important to the story, right? Right? So far, aside from Sam Hill, this has never been brought up again. So, I don't care. Furious Foo is not bad, but forgettable. As for Soul Crusher and Queen Banana, I'll get to those later. As for the rest of the episodes that I recently talked about, I'm going to take all of their scores back. And I mean all of them. Gabriel, 5 out of 10. Megaleaf, 6 out of 10. Guilt Trip, 8 out of 10. Crocodile, 7 out of 10. And you get the idea. Now, let us finish reviewing Season 4 by analyzing the remaining episodes, including the finale. A lot of peeps actually enjoy the finale a hell of a lot. Do I feel the same way? Have you read my poem? So sit back, relax, grab a bottle of wine, a bowl of mom's spaghetti, and enjoy watching me suffer because this is going to be one hell of a ride. But before I fasten my seatbelt, two very important things. One, I know a lot of you guys really want me to make a video about Adrian's CA in season four, and I will make that video right after this one, but this video will not be about him. It'll be about season four and partially him. Two, do I still want Gabriel to win even after making an entire video explaining why he sucks a lot? Nah, I'm not rooting for him anymore. I'm not rooting for anyone anymore. I just wanna see how this godforsaken show will end, and that's exactly my mission. This video is far from the end, just like the show itself. Well. 
Tell me where you're gonna take us. Tell me where you're gonna take us. About my poem, none of them are good, all of them are bad, is not entirely true. We're gonna start off by talking about the only good episode, at least in my opinion. In this chapter, Mary attempts to make Adrian see her as more than just a funny friend, but Alia tells her that she just needs to be herself. A stupid idiot with insecurities that she is super ashamed of. I'm not making this up. You don't see the beauty of your flaws. Your awkward gaga goofiness is what makes you special. Don't try to be someone else, be Marinette. You. What? Adrian and this stupid moron watch a video about a clown. Oh my god, is that Jamie Oliver? Jamie Oliver is back! Apparently, Jamie is a very close friend to Mary's parents. Mary meets up with Jamie so she can learn how to make Adrian laugh. Teaching this girl how to make this guy laugh is like teaching Jamie Oliver how to make a decent Asian dish. Hey, that's not very nice. Emotional, damn it! Jamie's first movie that he's going to make is about a french fry superhero. I thought it would be about a mushroom superhero. Yeah! Jamie Oliver loves mushroom. That mask is Uncle Roger, best in Westman so far. <laughs> Despite of it sounding so incredibly laughable, it's supposed to be a serious movie filled with human emotions. That's like making a serious TV show based on the Archie comics. Mary tried to make Adrian laugh. I assume a lot of you guys cringed at this because I'll admit, I thought it was very cringy at first. But after re-watching it, I honestly think it's good. I would even say it's a great scene. The way she tried so hard to make Adrian laugh, the way the scene began to get awkward, and the way the scene ended with Mary running away and crying. This scene showcases her flaws perfectly. I sympathize with Mary all the way. And you wanna know why? The writers treated this not as a joke, but as something to be taken seriously. And they did a really damn good job. I'm being serious, I freaking love this scene. It is a fantastic character a moment for Mary. I finally got to see her not as an unlikable freak, but as an actual empathetic human being with believable flaws. Her flaws were believable because I know that she is that type of person since the first episode. And I truly love how instead of telling the audience that Mary is having a hard time, they are showing that she's having a hard time. Best of all, it's not forced. It felt completely natural, which makes her a non-Mary Sue. It is the biggest reason why I like this episode. I really hope that they will keep this up because nowadays, it's very rare for me to sympathize with Marinette. Jamie declared his film to be made, but he got rejected. As expected. After being rejected, he gets acclimatized and transforms into psycho comedian. He looks really good, and his superpowers are awesome. Being able to change people's emotions by just looking at them while honking the nose is pretty cool. He is overall decent. Ladybug and Cat Noir tried to defeat him, but the result ended up having Mary and Tiki angry. Angry Marinette brings out her lucky charm, which is a Power Ranger helmet. She destroyed it because it's way too simple. So Cat Noir gets a second helmet, and he gave it a Ladybug color scheme. Oh, uh, why exactly? Oh, it's to trigger Miraculous Ladybug. But why? Tell me why. Tell me why. It was not summoned by Ladybug herself. It was just given a Ladybug pattern. So, if an object is painted this way, it can be used to trigger Miraculous Ladybug? Interesting concept, I guess. The episode ends with something that I just can't experience anymore. The episode ends with Mary and Adrian having a conversation about what happened earlier. And it wasn't cringy, it wasn't annoying, it wasn't awkward, it wasn't something that's just there. It was meaningful, which gave them actual chemistry and not to mention development. We all know that Adrianette is going to be endgame, and in my opinion, this scene flawlessly develops that. Why can't we get more of this? That's what she said. All we mostly get are cringe-worthy, aggravating moments, but not simple moments like this. If all of the Adrianette moments are like this, then I would honestly ship them for real. So please, for the love of God, please make them act like that to each other more often. Overall, Psycho Comedian is good. I do have some issues. For instance, Jamie Oliver's weird voice made me uncomfortable. Camembert Justice and Wonder Potato! <laughs> and also, the jokes that he told are not really that funny, for me personally. But I love the scene where Mary became human, I love how they actually made Cat Noir useful, I truly love the tete -a tete these two had at the end, and I really enjoyed the fight scene of Angry Ladybug vs Psycho Comedian. This episode did Marinette and Adrian right, and I'm going to give it a 7 out of 10. Yeah! yeah! We are now done discussing the only good episode. Let us move on to the bad ones, which are the rest of them, excluding one. Chi Lin. Did I say that right? The episode begins with Marinette's mother, Sabine, doing her daily routine. Mary plans on meeting up with Sabine after her painting class and after defeating a Santa monster. So the two of them meet up at the bus. Mary forgot to buy a gift for Sabine, so she took off with Sabine's wallet. That leads to Sabine not being able to pay for her ticket. Sabine tried to explain, but the inspector believes it's all lies. What? But that's so unfair! What's unfair is committing fraud and stealing from Parisians who do pay for their tickets, ma'am! You fucking sexist! Misogynistic! After a while, it led to a domino effect. Eventually, Sabine got akumatized, and she transforms into Chi Lin. So it turns out, Dearest Family isn't the first time Sabine got akumatized. It's this episode. Later, Chi Lin rejected the Akuma, and the dumbest thing transpired. This is where the episode falls apart. After Sabine got abused, after being arrested unfairly, after being akumatized by getting mad at the cops, after being a victim of injustice, 
Marinette takes the blame and apologizes for what happened. I am so, so sorry, Mom. This is all my fault, which is why I'd like to pay the fine with my pocket money. Oh my god! Oh my god! Are you absolutely out of your goddamn mind? It's all your fault? What? What? How is it your fault? Fun fact, this stupid episode actually tried to tackle a serious topic, and that is police brutality. Did it do a good job? Hell no! Simply because of this scene right here. Mary saying sorry for what? For something she did not cause. Tell me why! Tell me why. Because it is the responsible thing to do! How the fuck is taking the blame for something you did not do considered responsible? It's just stupid! You wanna know what's the real responsible thing to do? It's common sense! The ticket inspector, aka the person of power, aka the person who caused it all! Realizing his mistakes, apologizing for his abusive actions, and learning his lesson! But instead the writers let him free, as if he didn't do anything wrong. You think that's messed up? Well I've got news for you! I've got news for you! The victim of police brutality, Sabine, getting akumatized and willingly got so many innocent lives in danger. It's just a bad idea if you're trying to send a message about police brutality being a terrible thing. I am innocent! You're innocent, and yet you nearly destroyed a building. There might be people in there. You almost murdered a lot of innocent officers who are all not aware of what is going on and who are all just doing their jobs. You're basically portraying her as a victim of injustice, all while committing injustice. In other words, a hypocrite. So she got that from her mother. Wow. I honestly do not know who I should feel bad for in this episode. The person who got abused. Or the innocent police officers who are all just doing their job that almost got killed by Chi Lin. It is a huge mess. Which led me to believe that the real message that this episode is trying to convey is that it is all Marinette's fault. Is this some sort of joke or something? Here's a better way. If you really want to tell the audience that police brutality is something to discourage, akumatize the ticket inspector after abusing his powers. Make Sabine resist so he can get angry, which can lead to an akumatization. And after he gets purified, he will learn his lesson and take back his abusive actions. That way I can believe that there is only one bad side to disapprove and one good side to root for. Not two bad sides at the same time, because if you're going to do that, then you basically screwed up the message that you're attempting to deliver. Putting aside the poor execution of its message, Chi Lin is still a bad episode in General. Way before Sabine got abused by an officer, we see her taking care of Marinette. That never really went anywhere. Those things just happened and that's it. Nothing else. It didn't leave any sort of impact to the overall plot of the episode or the entire series. Even her painting class wasn't anything important. It was all a waste of my time. This episode sucks and I'm going to give it a 3 out of 10. Good job. Next! Alright, I know I said this episode made me lose all of my respect for Adrian, but that was only after I watched Kodaneka for the first time. Maybe I was being too harsh on this guy. Maybe I was just having recency bias. So, I decided to rewatch it, I gave it a second chance, and I think I got over recency bias. Let us now discuss Kodaneka, and I'm going to use my official final thoughts. If you guys love Adrian or hate Adrian, I can respect that 100%. You don't have to agree with me 24-7. That's not even my goal. My goal is to just entertain, not to be agreed with all the time, okay? Alright, let's do this. The episode begins with Adrian watching TV. It's about Ladybug's interview after defeating the giant baby again. When this baby got akumatized for the first time, it was a complete accident. It didn't work before and not to mention, Gabby was having a really hard time commanding the baby. So tell me why. Tell me why, tell me why did Gabriel thought this was a good idea? Again. Diversion? I guess so. Ladybug says that Cat Noir is a partner like any other and Adrian cries about it like a big fat baby who wants everything handed to him. <sighs> Ladybug literally said that there are certain missions that don't require Cat Noir. She didn't say he is 100% useless. Adrian whining about that makes him look like someone who is extremely entitled to Ladybug. Ladybug is mine and mine only. No one is allowed to help her but me. Also, there are some times, or maybe a lot of times, when Cat Noir's power isn't needed to stop an Akuma. Here are some examples. Ryuko's wind power was used to catch all the loose butterflies in Mega Leech. Rina's illusions were used to distract the Gang of Secrets, Mr. Pigeon, Style Queen, and so much more villains. Polymouse's multitude was used to fight the tiny the dictators. Sailor Moon's gift was used to calm down Reflecta. Purple Tigress's Falcon Punch was used to push away Captain Hardrock. Ugh, Captain Hardrock and Guitar Villain. The list goes on. Now tell me this, Cat Noir. Since you don't like to be a partner like any other, can you do all of those things by yourself? That's what I thought. I know I said in this video that I like seeing Adrian feeling depressed when he's beginning to doubt Ladybug because that made him interesting and sympathetic. That worked in Rocketeer because I knew where he was coming from. He has always been following the rule of keeping his ideas secret to Ladybug. And yet Ladybug had the balls to stab him in the back and bend the rules for herself and leave him in the dust. It was a good buildup that can lead to some interesting drama. In Kuroneko, why exactly is Adrian sad this time? Because he's a neglected child. His father has been neglecting and abusing him his whole life and that gave him long-lasting effects. That gave him scars. He's not feeling neglected by Ladybug. He is 
now experiencing deja vu. If only the writers framed it that way. If they did, then I would actually feel bad for Adrian. But no, they didn't. They instead framed this as an incredibly selfish desire. He's depressed because other people are helping Ladybug. How the hell can I possibly feel bad for a guy who is just feeling so entitled to someone? As I've said earlier, Ladybug clearly stated in the interview that there are tasks that don't need Cat Noir's help. She didn't say anything about Cat Noir being 100% useless and a waste of space and time. He's being left in the dust not because of Ladybug, but because of himself. He chose to believe that he's being left behind the dust, when clearly he is not. He's just given a chance to rest. As Robocop returns, Ladybug and the gang are out to stop him. This gives Cat Noir a chance for satisfaction. But as soon as he arrives, the villain is already dead. Nani? Cat Noir's official breaking point is right here. And honestly, it's very disappointing. I knew that one day he's going to break, but I never expected for it to turn out like this. Which is fine. Subverting expectations is a good thing, as long as it's done right. And did they do a good job? Of course not. Ladybug, before almost detransforming, tells Cat Noir to stop wasting her time. And in this moment, Cat Noir renounces Plague. Oh my god. Oh my god. Ladybug is curious to why he did that. Plague explained the situation, and let me tell you something. I love Plague. He's one of my favorite characters in the show. But I think this is the one and only time I freaking hated this guy. He tells her that this is all Ladybug's fault for forgetting about Cat. She replied that he should be happy that he's been given a break. Cat Noir doesn't want to have time off, Ladybug. He's in love with you. And your persistent calling on all the other heroes has broken his heart. Fuck you. Number one, Cat Noir had so many chances to talk to Ladybug about their partnership, most notably Rocketeer. There was a scene where Ladybug asked him if he's okay. She gave him a chance to talk. Why didn't he freaking make a move? Even before Rocketeer, Cat Noir should have talked in Haksan at the very end of that stupid episode. They had a private heart-to-heart -heart conversation. He could have talked there, but he didn't talk about their partnership. Instead, he's just, oh, I thought I'd never see you again. Please excuse the fact that I nearly killed someone on purpose because I'm sad. Where? So anyway, how's our partnership? Even in this episode, he still has a chance or chance says to work things out. The reason why she yelled at him at this part is because she was seconds away to transform back. No other reason. All he had to do was wait for another likelihood. Maybe he just ran out of patience. Well, then it's his fault. It's his fault for not talking to her before this episode. Number two. It was never truly verified that Ladybug hates or doesn't care about Cat Noir. There are episodes in this season where it is showcased that Ladybug does care about him. I am referring to Truth, Furious Fu, Haksan, Sam Hill, and this episode. During the interview with Ladybug, she defended Cat Cat Noir's absence. So don't you fucking dare tell me that Ladybug never cared about Cat Noir. Number three, tell me why. Tell me Tell me why is Ladybug to blame for recruiting other people when Cat Noir isn't available for assistance? What do you want her to do? You want her to just sit around waiting for his ass while the Akuma is on the freaking loose? Huh? Number four, tell me why. Tell me Tell me why I should feel bad for Adrian giving up being a superhero when considering the fact that the reason why he did that was bullshit. In Miracle Queen, Chloe denounced Ladybug because she was sick of being ignored. Her reason was bullshit, just like Adrian's, but the difference is her actions were portrayed as wrongfully wrong here. But in this episode, the writers wanted me to think that Adrian is not wrong. Bullshit! Number 5. Tell me why. Tell me why. Tell me why can't this guy be bothered to acknowledge Cat Noir's decision of quitting? He instead understands Adrian's choice, all while blaming Ladybug. It's, it's all sorry. your fault! I'm sorry. I'm it's sorry. all your I'm fault! Sorry. I'm sorry. It's all I'm your sorry. fault! I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry, alright. Sorry I came back here. Number six. Tell me why. Tell me why. Tell me why is Plague telling Ladybug that the reason why Cat Noir is upset that she is fighting alongside other superheroes is because he loves her. Congratulations, Plague. You just made his reason sound even more selfish and petty than ever. I used to think Cat Noir being in love with Ladybug was interesting, but this episode ruined it since they decided to tell the audience Cat Noir's love for Ladybug, and that's just pathetic. The most valuable role of making movies and or TV shows is show. Don't tell. I thought everyone knows that. If you're gonna tell me everything I need to know, then I will lose all of my interest. After Plague gave out his stupidly idiotic tirade, Ladybug agreed with him. All I can say now, I can say now 
This is truly one of the stupidest scenes ever written in the entire show. Change my mind. I'm actually hoping for someone to call Ladybug out for some things, like hypocrisy and her invalid reason for not revealing herself to Cat Noir. Seriously, if you two really need to be a good team, reveal yourselves to each other now and share your phone numbers. And don't you dare use the Cat Blanc excuse. Not relevant anymore and never will. Ladybug getting called out for that is something I really wanted to see. But no, they instead made this guy call Ladybug out for not giving what Cat Noir desires. What does he want? Ladybug being fair? No! Being the one and only partner of Ladybug because he selfishly loves her and doesn't care about what she's going through? Yes. They had the perfect chance to transpire an interesting drama between them, but they wasted it. They tried to make Cat Noir in the right, while Ladybug is in the wrong. Yet the writing is so goddamn stupid that I ended up believing the opposite. Shut up! Ladybug decided to choose a new holder for the Black Hat Miraculous, but Plague won't let her because... FINALLY! <laughs> no, 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 that's not going to work on me anymore since you gave me the best excuse of all time. Unlimited power of creation. I'm actually planning on retiring this excuse by the time Ladybug's power gets more logical information. So far, there is none. But who am I kidding? It doesn't matter anymore because there is an even better excuse and I promise. We will get to that later. Anyway, after Adrian got rid of all his Cat Noir merchandise and Ladybug pictures, Marinette is trying to solve the issue. Curse you, Cat Noir! This is all your fault! Ah, why do you have to be in love with me, huh? What am I supposed to do now? This is supposed to be funny, and this guy's situation is meant to be taken seriously. Her situation is just as bad, maybe even worse. No, it is even worse than Cat Noir's. This guy is just feeling selfishly left out, while Ladybug is desperately trying to work things out, all while suffering from sleep deprivation. Not to mention, she's the freaking guardian. She has way too much responsibilities to take care of. Cat Noir's selfishness is just making things worse, and yet this guy's condition is not a joke, but hers is? How is this not a double standard? Hey Cyrus, you cannot use the excuse too many responsibilities to defend Ladybug. Cat Noir has those things too, you know. Okay, try to compare Ladybug's duty to Cat Noir's. Okay, uh, Cat Noir has a full schedule of daily things that he needs to do, like fencing, Chinese classes. I said compare Ladybug's duties to Cat Noir's, not Adrian's. How is this a good comparison for the two? What does this even justify? From what I understand, this perfectly justifies... Ladybug's point! He should definitely be happy that he's been given a break so he can focus on the things that he is required to do in his civilian life. That's what this argument is all about, right? Proving Ladybug's point? Anyway, Plague came up with an idea. Lie to Marinette that there is now a new candidate for the Black Hat Miraculous. The lie is that there is no new candidate, it's still Adrian. Plague was able to convince him to return as Cat Noir, but not really. His design is decent, I have no problem with the hair, but the name sucks in my opinion. Cat Walker? That doesn't even make any sense. Cat Noir makes sense because he's a cat and he's black. Noir means black in French. Cat Noir. Purple Tigress makes sense because she's a tigress and she's purple. Spider-Man makes sense because he's a man with spider powers. But Cat Walker? Where the hell did the walker come from? Ladybug was about to give him a quiz about superheroes, but it was interrupted by possibly the best scent monster in the whole show. <laughs> Dude, shut up! What's really cool about Kuroneko is that the audience, including these guys, are not sure whether he is a Senta monster or an Akuma. It makes him really interesting. You wanna know the best part about this guy? He's original, not recycled. And that is something I don't see very often in Season 4. During the fight, Ladybug started to blame herself for Cat Noir's departure, but Cat Walker said something truly mesmerizing. Maybe the boy who was Cat Noir was more sensitive than it seemed. But his feelings for you shouldn't force you to pay more attention to him than to others. You take care of everybody equally, Ladybug. Now I want to take care of you. And I was actually starting to think that this episode is Cat Noir at his very worst. This dialogue officially changed my mind. I didn't care about this at first because I was too mad to care about anything. But now, after watching this episode for real, I can safely say that this is... Decent writing. Cat Walker's dialogue was just so beautifully executed. He is actually acknowledging the simple fact that the previous Cat Noir was being so insensitive earlier, and the other simple fact that Ladybug wasn't doing anything wrong. She was just taking care of everyone, and now Cat Walker is here to take care of her. To top it all off, I was emotionally invested in this scene because the buildup was good. This guy was acting irrationally stupid a while ago, and Ladybug was being blamed for all of that, which is bullshit. In my opinion, this wonderful scene marvelously wrapped that up. My respect for Adrian and the writers just went way up. Shut up! After a while, Ladybug started to act like a deer in the headlights. Why is that? Because... Cat Walker is here. She starts to fall in love. Tell me why. Tell me why, Tell me why you would fall in love with him, but not him. Doesn't make sense to me because they're literally the same person- Oh wait, maybe it's because this guy is serious, but not him? Yeah. 
Now this is getting weird. After defeating Kuroneko, Catwalker says that he will return the Black Cat Miraculous to the previous Cat Noir before they part ways forever. Then we get to one of the best, if not the absolute best, conversation in Miraculous history. Adrian is not sure if he can go back to being the old Cat Noir. Flag reassures him that he just needs to be himself, and he'll be back in no time. Adrian wonders if Cat Noir is who he really is deep inside. But Plague, in order to redeem himself as a character, after saying stupid things to Ladybug, he says that he's not Cat Noir, but he's not Adrian either. He's both. He's the perfect son who's really good in everything he does. But he's also Cat Noir, someone who just wants to have fun. One cannot exist without the other. I truly believe that that perfectly summarizes Adrian as a character. I swear to God, if this entire scene is a person, I would give her a kiss between the ears. Between the ears, yeah. Before the episode ends, Cat Noir says sorry for quitting and for causing too much trouble. Ladybug replied, just because she doesn't need him all the time, that doesn't mean she never does. She also says that he is irreplaceable. And the episode ends. Um, what do I think about this one? I can't believe I'm saying this, but for the first time ever, I honestly don't know. On one side, it's bad. On the other side, it's good. I'm having mixed feelings right now, and I really don't know how to feel. Well, you know what they say. If you don't know how to feel about a movie or a TV show episode, just give it a 5 out of 10. Whatever, dude. Do I hate Adrian now? Not really. He's still one of my top favorites, but I will say this. He's not my top one anymore. Since I've been defending Mary a lot in this episode, does that mean I like her now? Mmm, later. Let us now talk about the stupidest shit ever made. The episode begins with these guys playing football, and the reason why is because team spirit development. As someone who always works alone, this is something I need to experience. That's what she said. Later, these guys come to join the fight. Who are these guys? Um... Peter? Harry? Peter declined, so we told Harry to excuse him. They insist Harry to join in, but he replied with, I'm not a part of this class, and I'm not that good at soccer. I mean football. Seconds later, boom, he's really good. Now that's what I call a Marty Stew. He stated that he's not good at the game, so he can earn the audience's sympathy. And I wasn't exaggerating what I said seconds later. Seconds later, it is revealed that he is actually a pro, so that the viewers can be like, oh my god, this guy is awesome. Marty Stu. So now the game begins. I never knew Velma likes to play football. Apparently, Adrian doesn't know how to play football, and that makes zero sense. In Furious Fu, an episode that took place before this atrocity, Cat Noir, also known as Adrian, was really good at football, and now, all of a sudden, he's not? Now, just wait a minute. Season 4 is known to be releasing episodes out of order, so maybe this is before this one? Pfft, either way, it won't make sense. He's not good at the game, and now he's good at the game? How can Cat Noir suck at playing football when he did a really good job with the mother box? Because this is not a football ball. It's a mother box. Therefore, he doesn't know how to actually play football. What kind of sense does that make? That's like saying, oh, I don't know how to drink water because I've only done it from a glass and not from a bottle. It's still considered drinking water, you idiot. Not you, Melina. I love you. It seems like the writers are always refusing to take their normal pills. I wonder why. Yeah, go ahead, teddy bear. But uh, I might hurt someone if I kick too hard or jump. Ivan, I love you and all, but shut the hell up and play the game. Stop forcing me to feel sorry for you, you asswipe. Velma tells Daphne to just call her father, so the game will be stopped. But Daphne has a much better plan. No need. I'm waiting for a call from someone else. Someone much more powerful. That's what she said. <laughs> Michael, please. Please. Come on. So Chloe gets akumatized for the one, two, three, fourth, fifth time, I think. Does this count as an akumatization? And she transforms into Penal Team. Her design is honestly decent. Obviously a huge improvement over Queen Donkey Kong. But I have one problem though. Her mask. It sucks. I mean, I get what it's supposed to represent. A soccer ball. But she already has a soccer ball logo on her chest. Why do you need her mask to look like that as well? It feels redundant. Just erase the soccer ball design. Make it pitch black. Shrink it down a bit. And boom! Perfect design. Her superpowers are weird. That's a compliment. She can multiply herself, trap people in bubbles by throwing red cards, or by simply kicking them, and she can control the entire football field that she made, which means that she can move the goals around the place and set the time limit by her liking. Overall, she's a good supervillain. That's about the only good thing I can talk about in this godforsaken episode. I hope you enjoyed it while it lasted, because from here on out, it's all bad. And it's all bad. Oh yeah, her magical charm is now destroyed, thanks to the Super Saiyan butterfly. So, since the relevance of magical charms lasted a really short time, what the hell was the point? They literally made a massive plot contrivance, and are they ever going to bring it up again? She has the power of creation, and the only limits that she's got are the ones she puts on herself. She's literally a goddess now. So tell me why- yeah. Tell me why can't you just make an infinite invincible magical charm generator? Or maybe a shadow moth tracker? Why can't you just take advantage of the best power in the world? Oh wait, I know why. 
because the writers came up with an even better power and it is revealed somewhere in this episode. I assure you, we'll discuss that in a bit. So anyway, after trapping the entire stadium and after capturing Alia, Kaylin, the coach and Tornado, Penalty makes a proposition. Play football. If she wins, then no one will play football ever again. Ladybug and Cat Noir come out to play. Come on to they challenge penalty, but as I said, Cat Noir doesn't know how to play football. Which is just... Why the fuck can't he play foot? You wanna know what's even more stupid? I don't know a thing about soccer, m'lady. Maybe it's better to call the real team? If this show is realistic, then Ladybug's reaction would not be this. She would instead be aggravated. Because why the hell not? Thanks to Cat Noir's pettiness in Kodoneko, she suffered from a lot of stress, and on top of that, sleep deprivation. Cat Noir finally got what he wished for, and yet he tells Ladybug to go get the other guys? As if he has the rights to tell her. Cat Noir, if you wanna know what's good for you and for your lady, Try to fucking remember what you did in Furious Fu- While Cat Noir is trying his best to survive, Ladybug goes around to recruit superheroes. She found the latest candidates, but where the hell did Kagami, Misty, and Gary came from? They're not in the same class as Mary's. And isn't the freaking stadium blocked? Were they inside the whole time? Apparently, these guys are not enough, so Ladybug gets more guys to recruit. She chose Velma, Harry, Peter, and Ivan. Do you think that's enough? What I truly despise about this crap is, as usual, the execution. It was so incredibly, inconceivably, unimaginably, astoundingly, extraordinarily forced. We didn't get to see them try Form, because the writers knew that that would take too much time since they already wasted enough time forcefully introducing these guys by making them say I can't be a hero because of this and that you really think that I would be instantly emotionally invested in these four guys by giving them short individual speeches about why they can't be superheroes without actually giving them enough time to flesh out you really think that this was a good idea to begin with what kind of writing choice was this what were they thinking what were they thinking it seems like the show is so obsessed with making superhero characters out of nothing at all it's true that Mary and Adrian became superheroes out of nowhere, but at least the show gave them a lot of time to flesh out. That's why I have feelings for them. But these maggots? My feelings for these guys are nowhere to be found. Though I will say this, Velma using the dog miraculous is very appropriate. Anyways, the football game officially begins. Penalty immediately got the green one defeated. Can't he travel back in time with second chance? Do it now! Maybe he can't use his superpowers while in the bubble. Wait a minute. Who am I talking about again? As the force field covers up the whole city of Paris. The second round begins. So these guys just keep on passing and kicking the ball. Passing and kicking, passing and kicking, while showing off their superpowers. It's dumb, it's boring, it's nothing interesting, so let's just skip ahead, shall we? However, by the time these guys got fed up over Chloe's cheat codes, they decided to fight fire with fire. In other words, cheat. And oh boy, they did cheat. Peter uses his superpower, which is to make any object he wants. Thanks to this magic wand, I'm granting you all the power to indefinitely use your powers. Unlimited number of use! Oh. It is somehow even more powerful than the Ladybug Miraculous. The Ladybug Miraculous is known to be one of the two most powerful Miraculouses of all time. And you're telling me that a lower class Miraculous is a lot more dominant? Lucky Charm can only summon objects that can solve a specific situation. This guy's superpower can summon any object to solve any situation. Maybe he has limits to what he can summon. No, he doesn't. He can literally summon anything he desires. Like a magic wand. Which can grant infinite superpower usage. No consequences happened afterwards. It totally worked fine. <coughs> Would you believe me when I say it gets worse? Next up, Harry the Rooster uses his superpower, which is... Which is... The power to have any power he f fucking wants. My power is to choose a super ability, and I choose to score a ball anytime I shoo -ish, shoo -ish, shoo -ish, shoo Fun fact, I gave this title to Queen Banana and then to Ephemera, because I know the writers of the show. They are capable of making worse and worse episodes. Well, what do you fucking know? Panel Team, an episode that came after these two, dethrones them both effortlessly. I hope the writers are proud for what they've done here, because I can call it official. The writers of Miraculous Ladybug officially won the Guinness World Record for the worst writing in TV history. So after experiencing way too much bullshit, Chloe rejects the Akuma. She was finally allowed to sit on the bench with my waifu. They decided to team up against Marinette, and this is supposed to be a build-up to the finale. This is not the only build-up. As stupid as it sounds, the entire episode itself is a build-up to the finale. They wanted to show off the rest of these powers, because knowing what these powers can do is actually essential if you want to watch the finale. They will be utilized. Just thinking about the fact that Penalty is an episode that you actually need to watch in order to get invested in the finale is horrifying.
because I swear to my sweet lord, my sweet lord. I never ever 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 want to see this episode ever again I hope it gets deleted I hope it gets tortured I hope it gets a death penalty I hope it gets a gunshot to the face I hope it freezes to death at circle 9 because penalty is truly one of the most disgusting irritating infuriating exasperating enraging poisonous abominable annoying frustrating boring agitating inflaming dreadful pieces of fictional media I've ever had the vexation of watching it is a complete mess from beginning to end way too many storyline inconsistencies consistencies and way too many plot holes most notably these two these two pretty much destroyed the entire show miraculous ladybug has already been damaged a lot by mr pigeon 72 and ephemeral but this fecal matter this fecal matter managed to finish the job by crushing the remains until there is absolutely nothing left. Stop using the ladybug and black cat miraculous and just use the rooster and the goat miraculous. You two will be unstoppably unstoppable. Thank you so much, Peter and Harry. You officially made everything that I have done completely pointless. Every single argument that I have made can be safely thrown in the trash bin since none of them matters anymore. Who cares if Chloe is a wasted character? Who cares if Adrian is a wasted character? Who cares if Marinette is a terrible MC. Who cares if Master Fuck is garbage? Who cares if Gabriel is garbage? Who cares if the season 3 finale is garbage? Who cares if the entire show is garbage? Who cares about anything? I think I will officially take back what I said about Soul Crusher and Queen Donkey Kong. 7 out of 10. Yes, they do piss me off, but honestly, watching an episode that intentionally pisses me off is much, 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 much better than watching an episode that unintentionally destroyed everything. Penalty Team truly is the worst episode ever made, and it will forever remain the worst episode ever made until the globe starts the fucking warm. I am dead fucking serious. So, with all of that out of the way, I'll be giving Sam Hill 2.0 an enormous, stupendous, tremendous, monumental, magnificent, exceptional, remarkable, marvelous, ambitious, extraordinary, transcendent, majestic. Thank you for completing my life. I can now die a happy man. So, you're going after SIN, are you? Tell me why. Look, I don't need a reason. Seth is an evil man who brings chaos to this world. Cody, tell me you'll fight him alongside me. <sighs> Sorry, guy. It's like I told you. I fight by myself nowadays. Let us now talk about the finale. One score for two. The episode begins after Team Miraculous defeated the supervillain. Ladybug tells all of them to find a spot to detransform safely. Cat Noir whines like a big fat baby about the fact that he's just a partner like any other, despite of him being the first and the most amazing. And Cat Noir, despite being the first and most amazing team member of all, is now just a holder like any other. <laughs> You're serious? Yep, but you'll always be my favorite. <laughs> How often does she really kiss Cat Noir? As far as my knowledge goes, the answer is never. This is the first time she does that, without any accommodations involved. If I am wrong, then I think the answer is not very often. I know for a fact that their partnership and or friendship is not that strong. They are not this close. So that makes this kiss manipulative. She really did do that just to shut him up. And you know what? I'm glad she did that. Thank you, Marinette. Thank you so much for shutting this asshole up! I still think you should have used the Rooster Miraculous to shut him up when the coast is clear. Team Miraculous detransforms, and then these two go to see a movie. Meanwhile, Gabby cries like Miss Jackson's daughter, saying that he has failed to get Ladybug and Cat Noir's Miraculous millions of times. He also says that he's not worthy of their love. I am not worthy of our love! Dude, why? Why do you realize that only now? Of course you're not worthy of Emily's love. You've been trying to bring her back to life by endangering lots of innocent lives every day. Is this what Emily would have wanted? I assure you, by the time she does wake up and realize what you've done for the past four seasons, she would kill herself. Again! Seriously, dude. You're acting like a freak. No, I'm not acting like a freak! Natalie gives Gabby a plan. Make a risky akumatization. He targets a little kid named Faragi. 
great name. Froggy transforms into Froggy. His ability is possessing people to take risks. It eventually got to marry an Adrian. This is where things get really hard. That's what she said. <laughs> The next day, Adrian says that he will finally stand up to his father. I was hoping for this guy to stand up to Gabriel after being controlled and neglected his whole life. That would be an amazing development, but here it is not. It's just something that happens to move the plot of the episode forward. That's it. It doesn't really add anything to Adrian as a character, because he's not himself. He's being possessed by Risk. I mean Froggy. And we all know that by the time the possession got lifted, everyone, including him, will turn back to normal. Which probably means that he will end up not standing up to Gabriel. And for me, that's a big waste of potential. I wanted this to be real. Adrian and Lila star in a perfume ad. Gabby says that this should be filmed in different locations, so he can keep him away from Paris. Mary is, of course, scared that this guy will be going around the world with her nemesis. Mary talks to Adrian during dodgeball. He started to tell Mary the truth about his life. Despite of all the photos, the film shoots, the advertisements, and the fact that people think Adrian's life is amazing, Adrian is not happy. Mary replied, why did you just tell them that you don't want to do this? Basically, the writers are telling the audience how much these two are made for each other. Honestly, I think they did a good job, a much, much better job than back then. Without a doubt, they didn't make Mary stalk on Adrian or any of that crap. They simply gave them a conversation, a meeting meaningful conversation. But who cares? They are not themselves. This thing just happened not to develop Adrianette, but to move the plot forward. So... I don't think I'm supposed to care. Before Adrian leaves, Mary tried to talk to him, but Chloe got in the way, all according to the plan these two came up with. And am I supposed to care about it? Well, Chloe's relevance never appeared again after this part, so I guess the answer is no. Mary tells her friends that Adrian needs to be saved, but Alia, alongside her other friends, strongly disagrees and refuses to follow. Hmm, that's weird. Aren't you the same person who made an entire complicated plan of setting up a date for these two? And aren't you guys possessed by Froggy? What are Froggy's powers? Making people forget about their fears and do risky things they normally wouldn't take. So, why are are they not going along with Mary's risky plan? Who knows? As Adrian starts packing things up, Felix the badass offers to help Adrian escape. They decided to switch appearance. Turns out Felix's real plan was to find out more about Gabriel. And it was successful. He found Gabby's secret lair and Emily's body. Okay, this is cool, but why would Felix, the one who only appeared in four episodes total, be the first one to discover this? Don't get me wrong, I like Felix, I think he's interesting, but I surely thought Adrian would be the first to locate Emily and all of the dark secrets behind that painting. He actually did an FMR- <laughs> Don't ever fucking bring that up again. Maybe someday he will uncover the truth, but why would that be interesting in the first place? Why is Felix uncovering the truth about Emily? Interesting. I don't even know who this woman is, and I don't think I ever will. When considering the fact that it's too late, it's been four seasons and I have watched the finale. There is still no information about her. So, I don't care. Even if I do care about Emily as a character, I still wouldn't give a damn because everything can be fixed by the Rooster Miraculous. Felix, as Adrian, tells Gabby that he doesn't want to go. Gabriel commands him, but he stops while rubbing his finger where his wedding ring used to be. However, Felix actually started to go after Natalie while wearing Gabriel's wedding ring commands him. So he really is a Santa monster. Shut up! Mary transforms to save Adrian. Normally I'd spit on the screen when she uses her superpowers for stupid reasons because it makes her so unlikable, but I can give her a pass this time because she's not herself. She's possessed by Froggy. Adrian is waiting for Felix to call, but gets a call- Shut up! But gets a call from Kagami instead. And this is where Kagami shines brighter than a shooting star. I've been watching a lot of episodes where Adrian is portrayed as nothing but an indecisive puppet who can't seem to make any choices for himself. Kagami told him to redeem himself and apologizes if she hurt his feelings. Incredible. Just incredible. But not as incredible as this! Adrian told Felix to stop everything, but Felix deleted the message and goes to the train station. Ladybug arrives and, while not knowing that he is Felix, tells him to stay, but it didn't work. As the train starts to go, Gabriel, at the top of the Eiffel Tower, begins his plan. He makes a Santa monster called Strike Back. The design is magnificent, but what about his powers? Definitely awesome! It's not showcased in this episode yet, but here's what he can do. They're immune to any superpower, and they can copy any superpower as many times as they want. They just need to speak the phrase, Strike Back. Already, I can say it's better than Kodoneko. I now have a new favorite Santa monster. His powers are very similar to those things in X-Men Days of Future Past. Yeah, those things were scary, if I'm being honest. That's exactly Strike Back. He is, dare I say, a scary Santa monster? But who cares? It can be easily defeated by the Rooster Miraculous! Mary gives up but she is possessed by Froggy, so she came up with the risk of teleporting to where the train is going. Hmm, would she do the same thing if she wasn't possessed by Risk? Meanwhile, the real Adrian attempts to confront Gabriel, but he instead finds the monocle Felix used to locate Gabby's secret lair and Emily's body. As soon as he picks it up, he notices loud noises outside, and that's where the episode ends. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, Ladies and gentlemen, I present to you the final episode of season 4. It fucking sucks, 2 out of 10. 
finale begins where the previous episode ended. Mary is about to travel, and Adrian is finally, finally going to uncover the dark truth behind that painting by using Felix's monocle. But both of them were immediately interrupted by Strike Back. So. Let me get this straight. The previous episode made a gigantic cliffhanger that got me very excited to be honest. It is one of the few moments where I was actually extremely excited to see what's going to happen next in this show. But the cliffhanger became nothing in less than a minute! I am only 46 seconds in, and already I'm complaining. This show truly is the Usain Bolt of fucking up. Usain Bolt of fucking up. Elsewhere, Felix, still acting like Adrian, goes to the bathroom to take a pee. Cop Miraculous. However, it's a fake. Just like him. <laughs> Ladybug and Cat Noir team up to fight Strike Back. Cat was about to use Cataclysm, but Ladybug says it's too dangerous. Which is strange, because I thought she's under Froggy's spell. It doesn't work all the time, or it only works when it feels like it. And they began to argue while fighting a freaking Senta monster. Basically, their argument is about, why the hell can't this guy know her secret identity? I'm not sure if I should take this conversation seriously, because they're not themselves. They're under Froggy's possession. I don't need you to protect me. I'll never get akumatized. Uh, I love her. Not listening, don't care, and please go away. Later, Ladybug assembles team Wasted Potentials. They try to fight Strike Back, but they're only giving him more power. Strike Back throws a Ferris wheel, but Ryoko was able to deflect it. That leads to Rina. Michelangelo shielded her, and that is when the betrayal came to light. I'm sorry, I couldn't keep it from him. We'll talk about it later. What? Dude, no. You should argue right now. Just like what your favorite partner does all the freaking time. And also, aren't you possessed by Froggy? Take the risk to argue right now. Rena finds out that there are frog marks on everyone's necks. Ladybug noticed it only now. I don't know why she couldn't before. Cat Noir got his ass kicked by a literal child. We're not just dealing with the Senta monster. There's also an Akumatized villain. Uh-huh. She tells Cat Noir to detransform while everyone else goes to the fight. It's just to establish that Ladybug doesn't trust Cat Noir. He tried to use his cataclysm on those things, and since he is under frog spell, he will do it again. So, Ladybug has a good point. As soon as they split up, Cat Noir didn't listen and fight Strike Back. Strike Back now has Cataclysm. Ladybug's point has been proven even more. But I don't blame him because he's not himself. Ladybug summons her lucky charm. She decided to find Adrian, also known as Felix, since he's the only one, as far as she remembers, who hasn't been hit by Froggy. She brings out the Bunny Miraculous and the Horse Miraculous so she can unify into... Uh... Into... So she can unify into... Penny bug. Tiki, Fluff, Kelki, unify! Hey buddy, you need a ride? I was just on my way to the big doofus convention. <laughs> okay, maybe I was being a little too harsh when I first saw this. Maybe I was just having recency bias. And I promised, no, I'll try to never do that again. So I gave this a second chance and... It's even worse than I remembered. The patterns have zero harmony. The color scheme is agonizing. The shades are redundant. And the shoulders... <sighs> Tell me why! Tell me why do they look like that? Are they supposed to represent football players? If it is, then it sucks, because it doesn't fit. That's what she said. If you think this design is good, <laughs> well, uh, uh, I respect your opinion. Ladybug, I mean Pennybug. Why is she called Pennybug? Penny Bug. Penny is a cute girl's name. They named her Penny Bug because she looks cute. She gives him the dog miraculous, and Felix transforms into... What's his name? Flair Mittable? The name is hard to remember, and the design... As much as I love Felix, I hate it. It's really bland. Nothing more to say, so let's move on. Pennybug and Flair Mittable... Can I just call him Felix the dog? Travel back in time to find the akumatized object. When they travel back to the present, Paris is on fire. Felix the dog uses fetch to fetch the stuffed toy. Ladybug breaks it and erases the frog marks on people's necks. Ladybug congratulates Felix the doggy, and Cat Noir gets... jealous? I thought you already learned your lesson in Kuroneko, you idiot. He's not possessed by Froggy anymore. So what's his excuse for being jealous once again? Team Miraculous assembled for the final battle, but Cat Noir decides to get angry now. Are you kidding me, bro? Take a look around! You really think now's the time to act like a baby? Big grown-up is boring! I love being a baby! While Ladybug comes up with a plan, Felix the dog fetches her yo-yo. So they defeated the strike backs by using a force field and a portal. Funny how she didn't tell Rooster Man to just use his godly powers to Thanos snap them all out of existence. Felix retreats and says sorry for some reason, and everything went back to normal. Ladybug meets up with Alia for a talk. Alia says sorry for stabbing her in the back, and renounces the Fox Miraculous because she realized that she fucked up so bad. See? That's why I gave Alia a chance, even after doing something so stupid in Rocketeer. Because you know me, 
you guys. If you don't know, then here you go. I'm someone who is okay if a character did a stupidly irrational thing as long as they face consequences, acknowledge their mistakes, and or learn their lesson. And my god, she did. What's even more cool is the fact that they did this right after the battle is done, not during the battle, unlike what Cat Noir likes doing all the time. Alia is awesome and she will forever remain the queen of season 4. But then my second personality started to remind me, Hey Cyrus! Yes, Michael? Don't you know who you are? You're Cyrus the Great! Someone who doesn't care about the concept, only the execution. Oh yeah, thanks for reminding me. So, how's the execution? <sighs> I've become very predictable at this point, huh? The execution sucks. There was absolutely no tension between them, and the emotional drama is nowhere to be found. It was a fast, emotionless scene, and that doesn't make rational sense for the writers to pull off. Considering all of the build-up that they've made, all of the build-up that I've witnessed made me believe that this is going to be a massive drama, a really big deal to their friendship, because they've been friends since day one. Being stabbed in the back by your bestest friend in the world is a huge deal, but in the end, Mary and Alia are Cool? Mary is fine with this? What? Is this supposed to be a joke? Where are the dramatic emotions? Why even make these guys be on good terms after this? It makes no sense! Why not make their friendship officially Thanos snapped? That way you can raise the drama for the ending. Why not do that? Because God forbid actual drama happening in this stupid, idiotic show! They just love wasting things, huh? Alias Rena Rouge slash Rena Furtive arc has come to an end. Rena has been my favorite superhero character of season 4, and they put an end to her. Which is fine, as long as it executed well. But it's not, and I'm truly disappointed. I did not say that lightly, I swear to God. First, she was nothing. Then, she became something. And then, she became nothing again. She became nothing in the laziest, fastest, emotionless way possible. She doesn't suck as a person, but as a character. She feels like a tool now. I'm sorry, Alia, but I have to take back that title. You're not the queen of season 4. It's Julika. This video, even though I really wanted to consider it outdated, aged like fine wine. Because Rena Rouge sucks! I mean, Rena Furtive, whatever. I finally love you, and you do this to me? I was meant to make you shine! I was meant to make you shine! Meanwhile, Gabby decides to cancel the commercial plans and finds Felix the dog in his office. Felix makes a deal. He will give him every single Miraculous in exchange for the Peacock Miraculous. And this is where I lost all respect for Felix. This is just embarrassing. Why the hell would you do that anyway? Because he wants the Peacock Miraculous. Why don't you just tell Ladybug who Shadow Moth is? But Ladybug wouldn't believe that. She will if she sees it! Just sneak into his office like what you just did, but this time with the other superheroes, and they'll start beating the crap out of him. And then you will take the Peacock Miraculous for yourself, but instead he just waited for him in an empty room to make a deal. Don't you want him to lose? Do you care about him or something? You wanna work with him? What do you want? According to my research, Felix's objective from the start is to get Gabby and Emily's rings, so he can never be controlled by them ever again, since he is supposedly a Senta monster. Okay, but why didn't you just tell Ladybug every Thing, so she can call the other superheroes to kick Gabriel's ass and take the Peacock Miraculous for yourself and then you can be the new villain. That would make sense for me personally. It's just pathetic thinking that this literally could have been the very end of Gabriel if Felix actually used his goddamn brain. But the writers avoided it in the stupidest procedure ever just to move the plot forward. Truly pathetic. Pathetic. What's even more pathetic is that none of this would have ever happened if she didn't choose Felix to use the Dog Miraculous. Where the fuck is Velma? She did a really good job with the Dog Miraculous. Why didn't you find her? Why the fuck did she choose these guys but not Velma? Did Froggy's possession make her forget about Velma or what? Oh my god. Oh my fucking god! Fuck you, Felix. I thought you were cool, but that was just too good to be true. You're interesting, that's for sure. But that won't matter in the end if you're not cool. According to my research, this is intentional CA. Same case scenario as Chloe Bourgeois. Thomas Astruc hates Felix. He made him do something truly stupid, so I would begin to hate him. And he did a good job. I hate Felix now. But why won't you hate Chloe, Cyrus? Well, here's the big difference. Chloe, unlike Felix, at least doesn't do plot contrivances. All she does are bad things, which is fine by me because A, that's her point. B, people are not supposed to like her. And C, it was all intentional by the writers. Even the nonsensical stuff that she does, it was all intentional. I can accept all of that, but there is a limit to how much bad things I can take. Felix could have ended Gabriel forever if he just 
call for backup. I really can't see any reason why he didn't do that. I assure you, by the time Chloe does make a gigantic plot contrivance, even if it was on purpose, she will lose all of my respect. I will stop caring about the it was all intentional because Thomas hates her excuse. Chloe, along with the rest of these guys, shall never be excused for transpiring plot contrivances. Unless, of course, if the character is just a baby or a little kid. Or unless if the plot hole is not that big of a deal. Yes, it's true. Plot holes can be a small deal. But this plot hole caused by Felix is a gigantic deal. So, you're an idiot, Felix. Okay, back to the episode. I got way too off topic. I'm so sorry. You want to know what's even more pathetic than this? Felix uses fetch to fetch Ladybug's yo-yo. It teleported to the office and he was able to open it? Gabby managed to steal all of the Miraculouses instantly from the yo-yo without difficulty. And that makes absolutely no rational sense. Why didn't she just call the yo-yo back to her like Thor's Mjolnir? In Cat Blanc, it was showcased that Miraculous holders can do that. Look at it! Look at it! Look at it! I know she was having a panic attack and she couldn't move or think, but you know what? She doesn't need to because these guys shouldn't be able to open the yo-yo in the first place and get all of the miraculouses. In Gang of Secrets, Ladybug's yo-yo got an upgrade since she became Guardian. It allows her to have access to every miraculouses in the mother box. But for some reason, other people can do that as well? As long as they have the yo-yo in their possession? So much for a fucking upgrade! And also... Why does Sam Hill didn't her yo-yo disappear when she de-transformed? Is that even a part of her magical superhero suit? Are they separate? <coughs> Everything that happened in this scene were absolutely nonsensical. They forcefully retconned previous episodes and shoved illogical things just so I can feel drama and just so I could feel bad for Ladybug. This is what I call a Mary Sue moment. Simply because of the fact that I'm supposed to feel bad for a Marinette, but the writing forced it and made it seem unnatural. Marinette, Soup, and Chang! Or simply Mary Sue. Anyway, the next scene brought back Hawk Moth with all of the Miraculouses. No more Shadow Moth, thank God. Ladybug has a panic attack, saying that she messed up everything. She never accepted Cat Noir's help, and she sucks, blah blah blah. But Cat Noir reaches for her hand and says, We're going to get them back one by one. The greatest superhero knockoff ever made. The people of Paris and me, your loyal partner. We're gonna get them back one by one, and we'll make sure this never happens again. Liar, liar, plants for hire. It's pants on fire. And that is where the finale ends. So, after all of that, you wanna know what I feel about this emotional climax? Exactly. Nothing. I feel nothing but pure anger. But Cyrus, it is everything you've ever wished for. The heroes finally lost. Ladybug was suffering. Ladybug admitted all of her mistakes. Ladybug became a human being. Adrian was amazing. And you get a beautiful shot that is definitely worth a wallpaper. I don't fucking care! Yes, it's true. It is all I have ever wanted for the show, but... But I don't care about what's going on. I only care about how it's going to happen. Concepts are important, but execution is even more important. Because that is what makes the concept whole. Tell me this. How the fuck can I possibly be emotionally invested in this supposed dramatic climax? When the build-up, the build-up, was absolute dog shit. During the scene where Gabby finally got all of the Miraculouses, nothing made sense there. Nothing. So... I felt nothing but anger. And the scene where Cat Noir comforts Ladybug and promises that he will get them all back alongside her is, in my own unpopular opinion, disgusting. I think I'm the only one here who thinks that way. Here's why I think this is disgusting. Let us analyze the crappy buildup. The entire season 4, Adrian has 1. Infringed the orders of Ladybug for petty and selfish reasons. 2. Didn't decide to stop being obsessed with Ladybug like an absolute creep and an asshole. 3. Almost destroyed an innocent person intentionally and didn't even acknowledge it. 4. Became a damsel in distress several times. 5. Acted like a superhero who shouldn't be trusted at all. And finally, willingly gave up being a superhero for selfish and petty reasons. He still hasn't changed after all of that. I'm supposed to think that he's got Ladybug's back after all of that crap? No, I don't believe that he's her loyal partner. I don't believe that he is actually willing to be a real superhero at a time like this because I know that he wants something else. He's doing this not to return to Miraculouses, not to save the people of Paris, not to defeat Hawkmoth, but only for the sake of his selfish love for her. I'm basically watching a selfish piece of shit receiving a reward undeservedly. And yet, I'm supposed to be happy about this? This is supposed to be a heartwarming scene, but for me, it's like the writers are promoting selfish behaviors. And that's just disgusting. What if that's not Ladybug? Huh? What if that's Scarabella? Or anyone? What if he's fighting alongside another superhero who'd be willing to comfort Ladybug? Would Adrian still act like a real hero to save the city of Paris and the Miraculouses at a time like this? 
I don't think so. He's just so happy that he gets to comfort and cheer up his lady when no one else can. Deep down, I know he doesn't care about anything else, only her. And me, your loyal partner. Fuck you. I hate you, Adrian. Kuroneko is not your worst episode. This is. You are no longer one of my favorite characters in MLB. But don't worry, I still love you, and I still love Alia. In my fanfiction, let's take a look at this part of the climax, where all of the Parisians are gathered to cheer Ladybug and Cat Noir. I felt nothing, of course, because I don't know who these people are. They're just random background characters. They didn't even bother to add Mary's family in the crowd. What about her friends at school? Her teachers? If you added them, then I would honestly feel something. But no, I don't get to see any of the guys that I know, only the people that I don't know. And that is cheap. This is cheap. It makes this entire climax beautiful, but meaningless. So that, my friends, is why I abhor this emotional climax and the entire finale in general. The writing sucks, this costume sucks, the writing sucks, this guy sucks, the writing sucks, this guy sucks, the writing sucks, the writing sucks! This finale is nothing but a joke! Though I will say this, I do not hate Marinette anymore. I know I used to say both Mary and Adrian suck now, but hey, it's called recency bias. This is not recency bias anymore. She doesn't stalk anymore, and most importantly, she finally acknowledged all of her mistakes and hypocrisy. A lot of fans were mad that Ladybug in Kuroneko didn't apologize to Cat Noir for keeping him at a distance. Well, she did. Right here. She apologized. I hope you're happy because I really am. Don't get me wrong, I still do not care about her panic attack, and I still consider her a Mary Sue because her writing was so forced, and the fact that I'm supposed to feel bad for her, yet it was so forced, but at least she's a lot better now. Normally I hate Mary Sue's, but I can safely consider her as an exception because Marinette being a Mary Sue is honestly a lot better than Marinette being an obsessive, annoying, hypocritical stalker. I'm glad she stopped doing those things, and I'm glad she's becoming a better person. I sure hope this will stick, that's what she said, because I've been hating on her countless times. I'm tired of doing the same thing over and over again, and I really want something new. And my god, there is something new. I love Mary now. Still a Mary Sue! But unfortunately, Mary's awesomeness alone isn't enough to save the entire finale. She may be cool now, but Strike Back is still trash. And also, it's all over. The show is done. Gabby doesn't need to get Ladybug and Cat Noir's Miraculous because he now has every one of them, including the rooster! A Miraculous that can do anything it wants. So just use it to revive your dead wife who nobody cares for. If that's not going to work, then use the Gold Miraculous. A Miraculous that can summon anything without limits. Make a magic wand that can bring dead people back to life. And then the show will be over. No more conflicts. Use it now. Now, trust me! Trust me! 2 out of 10. Karma's a bitch, right? Karma's a bitch, right? So that was season 4. It's bad. Not really, but kinda. It still beats season 3 because season 4, despite of it being the official death of the show, it at least has actual good episodes. Like Gang of Secrets, Psycho Comedian, Mega Leech, Guilt Trip, Crocodile, and that's about it. I did not include Wishmaker, aka the most beloved episode by a lot of fans, because this, in my opinion, is just okay. Nothing interesting happened here. Just Gary finding out who these guys are forcefully. That never really went anywhere. As expected, 6 out of 10. No one cares about Gary. Actually, no, 5 out of 10, or maybe 4. I really do not like Wishmaker. Does season 4 have a much better finale than season 3? Well, if you remember the score that I gave Love Eater and Miracle Queen, then you know the answer. The answer is sadly no. Season 4 as a whole is better than season 3, but the season 4 finale is even worse, and here's why. The only reason why I think Miracle Queen is garbage is because it is stupid moron making Mary the new guardian. Now, this is actually not entirely out of nowhere. It has been foreshadowed in season 2 and 3 that Mary is going to become the new guardian. The problem is that it happened way too early. It happened at a time like this, which is in my opinion absolute bullshit. But I will at least give this credit for having a good buildup. The buildup may be small, but at least it's something. Something good. The final scene from Strike Back, however, had absolutely no good buildup. If all of the times Cat Noir acted like an irresponsible jerk, who is not worthy of being a trustworthy partner, is the buildup to this, then this is truly one of the most atrocious, abominable scenes I have ever ever witnessed in my life. Seeing this guy getting an undeserved reward for all of the shitty things that he has done the entire season makes me want to puke on my cereal and eat it with my bare hands so I can puke it out again right on his face. In Miracle Queen, Mary does deserve to become the new guardian after all the hard work she has done. Just not this early, you stupid piece of shit. Bottom line, the season 3 finale is, in my opinion, much better than the season 4 finale. I hate this finale so goddamn much. Is it the worst season finale ever? No, not really. Is it one of the worst season finales? ever? Yes. Here are all of my successful expectations in season 4.
That's about it. Here are all of my crumbled expectations slash disappointments in season 4. Number 1. Master Fuck's Backstory. I made a promise that I will take back what I said about this guy's backstory being garbage, as long as it will get more information. But we got nothing so far. So... That sucks. Number two, Alia. I already explained why. Number three, the finale itself. I'll admit, I was expecting this to be bad, but at least better than Love Eater and Miracle Queen, but no, it's not, and that sucks. Number four, Chloe's sister. I keep on hoping and hoping and hoping that she will become more than just a Queen Bee replacement, because I am someone who is always willing to give second chances. Am I really going to take back what I said about her being the worst character ever made by the time she gets more personality, more development, more anything? No, not anymore, because it's too late. I have my own limits, okay? Season four is is done and she is still nothing so I don't give a damn if she will improve or not Misty will forever remain the worst character in MLB history I won't come back you bitch I won't come back you bitch Yes, I'll admit it, Misty is much better than Chloe when it comes to being a person, a real superhero, and the holder of the Be Miraculous, but who fucking cares? Does that take away the fact that she's nothing? Why did I waste my time on you? And number 5, aka my personal biggest disappointment in season 4, Adrian, to be fully explained next time. So in conclusion, season 1, guilty pleasure, season 2, pretty good, season 3, see you in hell, season 4, get bent, season 5, Am I still hoping for the show to get better? The truth is, no, I'm not hoping anymore because that's impossible. Ever since these guys appeared on screen, all hope is truly gone, and I mean truly gone! So I don't think the stars will shine again. The stars will shine again. So why do you keep on watching this show, Cyrus? I wanna see how worse they're going to get. So I, for one, cannot wait to see season five. I swear to god, if Gabby won't use the Rooster Miraculous or the Goat Miraculous to make his wish come true, I'm gonna FLIP out. FLIP out. Thanks for watching, I hope you enjoyed. If you did, why not leave a like and a comment? Sorry that this video took so long to make because I just have so much stuff on my hands right now. I got business, personal things, and I got to take care of my channel. Nevertheless, I can't even explain how much I appreciate you guys. Thank you, thank you, thank you so much for all of the support. Season 4 has been one hell of a ride, and I truly believe that I deserve a break. So please, could you give me a break? Thank you. Not you again. The world is simply what it is. This is from the teachings of Bushinryu. Somehow, you rail against this teaching without even knowing it. Cody, you have vanquished a great evil. I believe this means that you must still hold some shred of goodness in your heart. I know that in your soul, there remains a disdain for those who seek destruction. Nah, he was just in my way, that's all. I took him down because he was bothering me. Then I take it you have no intention of returning. Returning? Yeah, I'll return all right. To my cell. That's where I belong. <laughs>